Good morning, everyone. Uh, good, cool Wednesday morning in early to mid-December. Uh, we have a really great lineup of discussions and presentations this morning from folks at WFO State College, as well as included discussion from a uh, representative from WPC. This morning, the focus is on snow squalls. So a timely topic as we get further into winter. And, you know, between all the advances that we've made over the last several years as far as the communication regionally and locally on snow school warnings and related impact tags and all the things that come along with that and all the issues and communication um, obstacles we run across, we'll have a good conversation this morning about that. Just a couple of housekeeping procedures as we get started. This webinar is being recorded. So if you have any questions along the course of the discussion, feel free to put them in chat or raise your hand. I'm sure we'll be happy to have an open conversation. And with that, um, I just want to first again thank Mike Clavera, Mike Druitz, the Sioux at WFO State College, Greg Duvar, the meteorologist, and uh, Mr. We Josh Weiss from WPC for joining us this morning. So with that, um, gentlemen, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much and welcome to the Science Sharing Series. Thank you very much, Jordan. Um, I will start sharing my screen here. How's that look for everybody? Looks good to me. All right. Although you might be in, you might be in a, you might want to go into presentation mode because I can see your other slides. Oh, okay. Let's see. I usually, where's the presentation mode part? Because I usually don't, I just usually share the screen. But On PowerPoint, there should be a button at the top. Oh yeah, okay. So. Greg, if you're using two screens, you might just need to switch which screen you're sharing to, because it was the, it, it was showing like your primary slide and also the next one coming up. Oh yeah. yeah. It's still showing both. Okay. It may, it may be a setting also on display settings at the top. You switch yeah. that up. Gotcha. Yeah. That'll, that'll do it to swap. How's that look for you? Perfect. Perfect. Looking good. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks for bearing with me there. Uh, thanks for joining today. It's a pleasure to to. Be uh, joined by Mike Colbert, Michael Jurowitz, and Josh Weiss at WPC uh, to talk about uh, snow squall science and and all the issues uh, related to uh, impact based warnings, tags, road weather, and and uh, research going on. It's it's a, an exciting team effort, um, and I really have to acknowledge, you know, going back to the first days of uh, statement of need written with Dave Nicosia at uh, the Weather Service Binghamton to Pete Binaco, Sandra LaConcha, Burlington, all the way to our current staff and, and folks at the, the Winter Weather Program, Sarah Perfader, Michael Basili, um, and, and so many others. Uh, the, the teamwork has just gotten better in time and more and more people joining the fray with their talents. Um, we're really making a big difference and um, it's just a pleasure to be involved with everybody. Uh, such great teamwork. So. Let's start out by looking at two events uh, that really demonstrate the mode, the, the range of kind of events we look at and, and our current state of prediction uh, and warning for these events and, and the tools we're using to do that. Um, so, it, of course, we all know the reason we're issuing snow squall warnings, they're, they're deadly, severe local and deadly. Uh, they're severe local storms and they're convective. And that realization in the Weather Service has really propelled this effort forward over the last 10 years. Um, once the decision was made to approve a formal warning product, um, DSS could then occur in a formal way and more people jumping in. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the iPhone time-lapse mode was created specifically for snow squalls and that has propelled this effort as well. Uh, just uh, tongue in cheek there, but a lot of uh, great innovation, but we're still dealing with this problem and still trying to mitigate it and, and every avenue that we have to do that. And so, you know, we have this tool now. We have, have the warning tool um, 
and snow squalls are warnable hazards with the highest urgency. And we've been given this mandate uh, to use wireless emergency alerts, which comes with great responsibility. And we're tuning that now um, to, you know, just differentiate between not run of the mill, but a life threatening hazard, which is a general snow squall. And then those that we know are the most dangerous, the ones that coincide with flash freezes and mass pileups. And so this presentation, you know, we're basically looking through the lens of this, the impact based warning tags as we're looking at these events. Um, you know, one, one event strongly forced an Arctic front on February 19th and one that was a uh, more open cellular weekly forced convection, but nonetheless, even higher impact than the February 19th event. But there were successes from the February 19th that, that ran regionally, um, even up to the national level, national center messaging. There's just so much good going on with this. So, but all in all for this year, since we're trying to wrap our hands around the better, best way to use the impact-based warning tags, we wanna kind of look at these two events through that, that lens. And so, you know, snow squalls are they're convective systems. They're mesoscale convective systems. They follow the rules of convection. They're uh, ingredients based, um, you know, cape, wind, the shear, um, you know, a salivaric pressure rises in couplets, uh, pressure rises, uh, you know, force the instability into bands. And uh, essentially, you know, we can track these on a larger level. Um, there was a really incredible example of a snow derecho back in 2003, which came through State College. I remember about two in the morning. It was just like a roar outside. And I, at the time, I didn't know exactly what it was. I'd, I'd been on shift that night, but this thing had originated all the way up, uh, you know, in central Canada. And so with the right conditions, they can proliferate just like warm season convection. And their ingredients base, as I mentioned, need moisture instability, uh, a source of lift, um, but they're varying modes with these. And um, the really, a really great tool that propelled forecasting forward was the work by Pete Binacos and Andrew Lacanto for the snow squall parameter to try to, to try to characterize, um, uh, you know, situational awareness tool that would let forecasters, you know, differentiate between just run of the mill snow showers and and squalls and of course we know shear is what causes uh, convection to be forced into different modes you have linear uh, say along an arctic front strong shear and cellular uh, less organized less intense both of those have major ramifications for how we message and warn for uh, snow squalls and so, you know, what Pete Binacos did uh, with Andrew Lacanto is look at the uh, look at the parameters, and and come up with a non-dimensional number to highlight areas favor favorable for snow squalls. And they used the NAR data, a database of 36 squalls, uh, tuned to the NAR data. Actual, you know, squall events that produced half mile or less visibility. Um, and the two key things to remember about the snow squall parameter, which may not be known. Um, you know, the snow squall parameter approaches zero as any of those parameters approach zero. You, you need to have those ingredients. But it's also set to zero when the surface wet bulb temperature is greater than one degree Celsius, which means you're, you're already focusing in on areas where uh, at least the risk of a flash freeze is going to be elevated. So that, that's an important point, um, one that, you know, over the years I've kind of glossed over, but it really stuck out to me this last year. So we now have the snow squall parameter. We can look in, you know, at uh, in concert with other model fields, moisture instability. It's strongly tied to instability and the isolabaric uh, component pressurized couplets, uh, but it's a fantastic tool and really propelled understanding forward on, on uh, you know, confidence in snow bursts. And we're, we're pretty good at anticipating when there's gonna be, uh, you know, a heavy snow shower squall producing half to quarter mile visibility. In fact, I haven't seen a situation where the, the snow squall parameter was adamant about there being squalls where we didn't receive, you know, a quarter to half inch, or sorry, quarter to half mile visibility. So that's just a background to that because it's important to know that going into these events. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the strongly forced uh, Arctic frontal event from February 19th and Mike Jurowitz is gonna follow up with, um, 
you know, a, a weekly shared event, but still high impact from March of last year. So February 19th was kind of like your slam dunk Arctic event. Um, every parameter that could possibly light up for this event did, and it did so more than two days in advance. And so you had a really strongly forced um, arc of instability and, and focused in uh, along the frontal zone. Shear was from the southwest, uh, south-southwest 40 knots, 110 knot jet aloft. And, and the lapse rates, uh, six to eight uh, degrees per kilometer uh, at 16 Z that day, we had plenty of instability. So um, it was just kind of like your slam dunk day. And the messaging for this was just off the charts all the way up to the, the National Center. I don't think anybody was surprised by what uh, ended up happening that day, but the evolution is also something to speak of. Um, we'll just go through time looking at, you know, preliminarily with these stronger forced events, you do get an area of like homogenous light snow out ahead of it. And that's that's what happened on this day. You can see, um, you know, some of the visible enhancements, some of those clouds were producing, you know, half mile vi uh, visibility in snow, a little bit of overproducing snow in that situation. But as time went on, um, the shear really lifted those that element out, uh, really peeled it away to display the actual uh, squall out ahead. And I should mention, as an aside, in real time, talking to PennDOT during this, just having that in the background, uh, able to have a discussion about, no, this this initial light snow or moderate snow is not the squall. We are, we're following the actual squall is going to be behind this. And then, oh, look, the high clouds are peeling off. That means there's going to be some surface warming and potentially, you know, raising the possibility for flash freezes. All that information conveyed in real time during this event. So um, here's what it looked like at that time as the as the squall line moved through State College, uh, just a wall of snow. Um, it wasn't particularly windy with this locally, but you can see it went from basically six to 10 miles visibility to down to almost nothing in a very short amount of time. And I'm not going to call up the video there, but pretty impressive video is some meteorology students uh, were enveloped by that on a parking deck. So, uh, you know, we've been messaging this locally all morning, like, like most other offices. And, you know, from central to northern Pennsylvania, surface temperatures were below freezing. So we're basically seeing snow accumulations on roads as the squall moved through. Uh, but right at that opportunity, when the high clouds and the, the, the homogenous area of snow moved out, there was the opportunity for surface heating out ahead of the front. And correspondingly, we did end up with an accident that occurred really at the first possible um, timing of a flash freeze. And this is one of the graphs that we have from our, our state uh, PennDOT ROS system, but in the yellowish green is visibility. So you can use that as a proxy for when the heavy snow arrives. Um, so basically it goes down to quarter mile or less. Uh, but you can see the air temperature is in blue and surface temperature is in red. So essentially I mentioned the, the first opportunity for there to be uh, a flash freeze is when the road temperature goes above freezing and then the snow arrives and you get melting initially on the road surface, and then the road surface temperature kind of wet bulbs down to the air temperature and then cools even further, as you can see. Um, and that's how we ended up with a flash freeze. In this case, uh, it actually happened on the, like the last one or two miles of I-81 in our CWA. Um, and I do want to mention this graphic in the middle shows in pink, all of the snow squall warnings that were issued on that day. Um, there's a little, there's an area here in Schuylkill County, the southern uh, part that shows up as a white sliver there. That's where we did not warn. And I think it's, it's, uh, we were kind of surprised afterwards because, you know, Mike, Mike and I were working this event, Mike Colbert. We drew that box where we thought, okay, this is where it's still cold enough for there to be a flash freeze. We're going to warn on these areas. And then as the line progressed through there, we realized it's too warm to the south. So we differentiated, we, we issued an SPS for, for the snow moving in there, but it just, meteorologically, it was not going to be possible uh, at that time to 
get a flash freeze. So this just kind of shows we're not going to be able to be that specific every time, but it shows how far we've come to understanding the impact and, and really be ready to issue impact based warnings and differentiate between the high impact ones and, and maybe the lesser still significant life threatening, but not, not the pilot days. So what ended up happening was a, a stretch on I-81 going around a curve downhill, um, somebody spun out. And then there were other vehicles that mostly were trying to avoid that at lower speed. Um, so most of these vehicles involved, it was a minor, you know, kind of fender bender kind of thing with really minor injuries, fortunately, but still, still impact. So, um, and this is really what we've been focusing on is trying to differentiate between the high impact, life threatening, severe life threatening events that correspond with flash freezes. And uh, more and more states are having these these data sets and sharing them. And we're, we're really fortunate to have that from PennDOT. So here's a base loop um, showing the, the stratiform snowfall out ahead and little bursts in there. Um, again, we were able to talk to PennDOT in real time and let them know that what was coming through initially was not the actual squall. We were following the bands back behind, and then they would let us know they were following from their their traffic center, looking at all of their webcams. And like, oh, looks like you know Milesburg just went down. Um, they could tell us in real time, and and we could just share on a casual basis that information without kind of diverting our attention from operations, which was really helpful. But you can see the progression of the squall across central PA and then into our southeast areas. Um, and again, all the surface temperatures in these areas right now are still at or below freezing. So we didn't see flash freezing conditions until the, the higher clouds peeled off and we, we got more uh, infrared radiation through to warm the surface. So what other, the other thing that's remarkable at this event is model performance. Um, you know, what you just saw is mirrored very well uh, in this particular case, the HREF. Um, timing, certainly off by an hour, one to two hours, which is typical, but I mean, look at the mode. It, it, it's almost perfect. And that's, that's remarkable. You go back 10 or 15 years and we just kind of had to imagine structure like this. So um, pretty remarkable to, to see that. And Mike, Mike uh, Colbert uh, mentioned that the NAM nested best with timing, but still one to two hours uh, behind the rest of the high-res guidance. So that was a look at a, a strongly forced event. I'm going to turn it over to Mike Jurowitz, and he's going to go over a remarkable uh, late March uh, day uh, with squalls here in central PA. Mike? Thanks, Greg. Appreciate sure. that. So um, Greg, like Keita said, he talked about uh, really a pretty strongly forced event from February of last year. In many respects, this was the more challenging one. Uh, the, the forcing was not quite as strong, a little bit less in the way of, of deep layered shear, which kind of translated into more of a cellular mode. Uh, we had some lake enhanced streamers. So this really was more complicated and, and more challenging from an operational perspective. But you can see uh, some of the, the panels on the four uh, panel imagery here on the right, the snow squall parameter in the upper left showing some elevated values certainly coming into northern and western Pennsylvania. There was a strong mid-level trough, a nice Fort Max uh, to our northwest, uh, and, and there was a, a 100 or so not Jet Max. Even these values really weren't quite what we saw at the February event, but there was some degree of synoptic forcing. I think one of the main things that really set this event in motion was the low to mid-level instability. And you can see that on the on the lower left-hand panel with the uh, eight to nine, even upwards of 10 degrees uh, C per kilometer lapse rates um, in the lowest three kilometers of the atmosphere. So Greg you can go ahead and, and uh, move the slides. So, um, and then again, another, uh, some images here on the right. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna give a call out to the day cloud phase satellite imagery in the upper right. That really is a nice tool that we can use in tandem with the radar sometimes to try to delineate. Uh, and then with some multi-radar, multi-sensor uh, products too. But, 
you know, the radar coverage is not equal uh, in every place, obviously. And in our far eastern and southeastern zones going into southeastern PA, the lower level radar coverage is is not that great. And with a shallow wintertime phenomenon, the, the radar beam can overshoot. So you have to rely on other uh, other uh, artificial intelligence, so to speak, to, to, to see the intensity of the squall. And the state cloud phase can really help sometimes in showing the more bubbly, deeper uh, cloud tops. And then the, the uh, lower image here just shows pretty pretty tragic consequences on this day. We had a very significant pile up in, in the Southern Poconos on Interstate 81. Up, I think uh, upwards of 80 vehicles were involved in that. So Greg, go ahead and switch. Oop. Yeah, and then this, this uh, I don't know if the animations are gonna play here or not, but uh, you can try yeah, and, and, and either to see if they work. Maybe a little bit choppy video, but bottom line is again, it's pretty, pretty uh, horrific images here. You can see we actually got some footage of some of the uh, collisions that took place in toward the uh, the back end of this pileup. And in the lower left, this, uh, this vehicle is gonna end up plowing right into a, a truck here. So really, like I said, uh, um, Horrific stuff, and 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 unfortunately, we had fatalities. Um, and uh, this this was a this is a very newsworthy event, made the national and even inter international news for a couple of days afterwards. So it it just goes to show you what what a snow squall with flash freeze conditions can really do, and what motorists who are not prepared are facing when they drive into this. So Greg, go ahead and, and switch. So unfortunately, right on Interstate 81 in Schuylkill County for this event, we didn't have a uh, roadway weather information, an RWIS sensor that was super close, but there was one upstream, I think maybe eight or nine miles in Southern Columbia or Southern Northumberland County. Um, and it shows kind of the, and I think we think it was pretty representative probably of the conditions that were at play on I-81. We had had a stretch of pretty mild uh, temperatures. You know, we were we were in the late March now. Sun Angle was starting to get uh, uh, much higher. And so the road surface temperatures, even uh, during the nighttime, there was a pretty good separation between the uh, road surface values for this sensor here on I-80 and the uh, pretty anomalously cold air mass that had come into play maybe 12 to 24 hours prior to this uh, snow squall event here on March 28th. And again, much like Greg showed the uh, greenish tint, you can see the, the sharp lowering of the visibility as the squall moved in. And the, again, evidence of flash freeze conditions where your road set surface temperature with a little bit of sunshine out ahead uh, did spike up into the mid to high 30s, but as the squall came in, air temperatures were very cold. Uh, they were well down into the 20s, uh, probably even a little bit lower at elevation in Schuylkill County. Uh, and you can see where the road surface temp fell below freezing with the heavier snow and created those, those flash freeze conditions. You can go ahead and move ahead, right? So then uh, you're seeing a loop here of the day cloud phase uh, on the left and the regional radar on the right. And then maybe just some things to, to keep in mind as you watch these loops, kind of the challenging nature of this event with uh, trying to figure out where, where do you need snow squall warnings, if at all? Uh, where would special weather statements be uh, more appropriate? And with these, Again, this event was a bit more cellular in nature. You had some lake enhanced streamers. So there were there were challenges compared to the February event. It was not one cohesive frontal band like we saw in February. And again, taking the uh, complexities too of uh, perhaps the radar beam overshooting in spots. 
So all these things you gotta you, you gotta keep in mind with these type of events. Certainly not easy at all from an operational perspective. So and then this uh, this here showed some of the members of the HREF and how they handled this specific event. Uh, although the 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 flavor was generally the same, there were certainly more variants with respect to the convective mode that the models uh, had foreseen going into this March event. And this really makes a lot of sense. There's a good tie back to warm season convection. When you have events that are not quite as strongly forced, a little bit less in the way of deep layered shear, I think sometimes our convection allowing models are gonna maybe struggle a little bit more into the mode that's gonna be most prevalent. Some showed some very well-defined uh, bands some were a little bit more cellular. The placement and timing was a little bit different member to member. And I think this just goes to show you that we we truly need to have our, uh, our wits about us, so to speak, going into these events. The cams are certainly a good tool to help, but there's a lot of things that happen in real time. And sometimes you can see pretty quick that maybe they don't quite have the, the exact right idea. So you can advance, Greg, again. And then the probably the one member that did the best job of at least depicting the cellular nature was the uh, the uh, the uh, HRW the uh, NSSL core of the HRW. It did show a little bit more of a cellular flare to some of these uh, lake streamers and uh, convective cells coming through Pennsylvania. So you can move ahead. Yep. And this is a uh, so this is a uh, part of really great research that was done uh, in our office. Mike, Mike Colbert really was spearheading this. And what we did is there were a number of, of known multi-vehicle pileups uh, due to snow squalls. We had locations and dates of a lot of these. So in uh, situations where we knew a particular Arwis site was representative of the squall conditions, we went ahead and we looked at roadway temperatures versus air temperatures, pre-squall, during the squall, and just afterwards. And the main overarching point of this research was that, um, and I think we surprised a lot of our transportation partners when we, we uh, showed them the results of the study, is how warm the roads can be at times pre-squall and just how, how quickly they fall when the right conditions are in place with cold air temperatures and uh, heavy snow for sufficient longevity. We had a couple of cases where, where uh, roadway surface temps are between 45 and 55 Fahrenheit. And in just a matter of minutes, uh, they can fall below freezing and create significant flash freeze conditions. Again, if the air temp is cold enough and the uh, squall intensity is sufficient enough and lasts for long enough. And uh, the one uh, bullet point here on the left, I wanna shout out for this particular March event, orientation of snow squall with respect to the interstate. So for those familiar with the geography of, of Pennsylvania, Interstate 81 basically travels from Southwest to Northeast for most of its stretch. And these kind of lake enhanced streamers and stronger cellular snow showers and squalls on this day were traveling from northwest to southeast. So they really kind of intersected I-81 uh, at an orthogonal angle. And if you're gonna have a persistent or at least semi-persistent lake stream or a band, that, that could well act to enhance the longevity of moderate to heavy snow. And I think that that came into play on this particular day, even though maybe the, the the radar didn't show it that well with the beam overshooting, you know, we we could kind of reasonably infer that favorable orientation for perhaps more longevity of uh, problematic snow squalls. So you can go ahead and advance, Greg. So um, a lot of words here on this slide, but this just this uh, just to uh, shout out a couple of things to show the, the the challenges in a snow squall event that's not quite as strongly forced, maybe cellular in nature, 
you got to think long and hard about where and for how long you're going to put warnings in effect. Uh, for a particular interstate, you might have heavier bursts of snow with lighter snow interspersed that could last for several hours. You know, what, what's the best product to use? Um, how, how large do you draw your polygons if you think a warning is appropriate? I think we all kind of know the predictability of these type of events is is a little bit lower when it's not quite as strongly forced. So what are, these things really speak, I think, to the advantage and, dare I say, necessity of having a mesoanalyst when you're going into an event like this. Because I think in in some respects, it's even more complicated than uh, our our analog warm season severe convection because we're not only monitoring atmospheric trends but we're we're closely monitoring roadway trends as well. We're pretty blessed in Pennsylvania to have a good Arwis network uh, that allows us to be able to to monitor these trends real time. So there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts with these snow squall events to try to truly evaluate. Do you have conditions favorable for a flash freeze? Some social science things. Um, unfortunately, some of the people on March 28th that lost their lives, but I think maybe many of them were from out of state. And so you get a lot of, you know, interstate travelers who aren't familiar with the local conditions, um, don't really know the right ways to handle it. These late season, early spring events could be misleading because uh, you could be have a stretch of warm weather like we did here going into it. Uh, people with situational awareness may be a little bit less. Uh, I, I think a great model going forward, not only for our office and region, but maybe for the agency, we have a, a, a really positive evolving relationship here with our, our transportation partners in Pennsylvania. Greg alluded to the fact that we we're in real-time contact with uh, several of our PennDOT districts as these events unfold. So if we're truly on it with the mesoscale and we can communicate that, and you know, Slack is going to allow us even to do this graphically now as, as not just even talking to them, I think we can provide some great real-time IDSS uh, with these events going forward. Another bullet point here is a consideration of a, a long term special weather statement going into it, maybe this can almost act like a snow squall watch or a, or a proxy going into it. Because strictly speaking, we don't have a, a product to really do that right now. But maybe raising awareness on the order of three to six hours before going into it that we're looking at this potential uh, can be really helpful. And I think our, our office in particular and and Certainly in the weather service more broadly, we've done some great outreach things to try to educate the public and educate drivers. And, and that's only going to continue. So you can go ahead and advance, Greg. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton to Mike Colbert. He's going to talk about some uh, research efforts that we've done both at our WFO and that's going on at Penn State right now. So Mike, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, there's a student, Carl Schneider, at Penn State. He's working with Dr. Matt Comgen, who is a, a pretty well-known radar expert and professor at Penn State. And I think uh, Dr. Kelly Lombardo, a more of a mesoscale expert, is also working on this project with Carl. Uh, but together, they are looking to put together a climatology of snow squall um, characteristics, environment, classification in central PA. Um, so they wrote, they together wrote a snow squall identification algorithm that uses, um, uses kind of AI and, and radar data to identify areas where there's sufficient reflectivity. So I think it's 20 dBZ or greater that they're looking for. And also where that reflectivity has like a sharp gradient between 20 dBZ and pretty much nothing at all uh, to identify those leading edges of a snow squall. Because we know that snow squalls they come on so quickly, there's the classic wall of white. Uh, so that's how the algorithm works. And then Carl went through each and every radar scan um, that was identified as a snow squall case and bins them into groups. Uh, Greg, could you go back slide? 
Thank you. So he bends them into groups. So there's four main types uh, that he bends them into. The first type is type S1, that's in the top left. That's the single frontal band. That'll be the classic high-end snow squall, um, the type that Greg spoke about in the mid-February case from this year. That would be a single frontal band. So that's S1. Uh, S2 would be single cells, so kind of the popcorn convection kind of look to the radar scattered all over the place. Uh, type S3 would be a mixed mode of, it could be multi-cells, it could be lines and cells. Um, type S3 is also broken up into 3A and 3B, uh, where 3A is lines that are oriented perpendicular to the motion, so more progressive and type 3B, uh, lines that are oriented parallel to the motion. So kind of like streamer bands, but but not quite. They're, they're a little bit more cellular looking than streamer bands, because streamer bands is type four. You can see what those look like. They're the classic, very narrow, um, usually lake effects or lake effect related kind of snow squall look to them. Um, so, this is something you know we've we've already touched upon as far as our uh, two events go and the differences between them. But um, pretty interesting work that Carl's uh, doing at Penn State, and I'll talk in the next few slides a little bit more about what they're doing. But um, maybe we ought to consider even having Carl present the whole um, collective uh, in more detail. And certainly, if they if they publish a paper, I'll share that. So, Greg, if you move on to the next slide. Um, one of the things that was pretty interesting is as far as flagged radar scans go, the type S1, that classic linear snow squall bands, that only represents 4% of all the snow squall scans. Um, so a, a pretty small minority, um, but we know that they are very high impact. They produce, I don't know if they produce uh, necessarily a majority of the impacts as far as pileups go, but they're, they're definitely very high impact and we know that. Um, that being said, there are often events where you have one type of snow squall mode and then it transitions into another. And that is something that Carl spoke about. So we might have a snow squall event that starts off with an S1 band coming through and then transitions to something more like a 3A or a 3B, those multi-cells and band uh, mixed modes. And then at the end might turn into an S4, those little narrow streamers as we transition into more of like a lake effect regime. So in this next slide, uh, one of the interesting things that they're working on next is they define this cloud layer depth, um, which they define as pretty much the unstable layer or layer with constant theta E. Uh, so that bottom right image there is showing the uh, theta E profile. And you can see that blue line indicates the depth at which it's pretty much constant. So constant theta E, um, the first occurrence in the column of theta E more than two kilometer greater than the, sorry, two Kelvin greater than the surface, that's where they uh, denote the top of the cloud layer. And this cloud layer differs from uh, type to type as we go from S1s through S4s. So the next slide shows um, kind of how that transitions. So you can see that for S1s and S2s, so S1s, again, that's the single frontal band and twos are the single cells. Those typically have the deepest cloud layer depth or the deepest unstable layer near the surface, the deepest mixed layer, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then types S3B, which is those, um, those mixed lines that are parallel to the motion and also the streamer bands, S4, uh, since they're, they're pretty similar to each other, they have the shallowest um, depth of the cloud layer or mixed layer. So that's pretty interesting and pretty insightful, I think, as far as predicting these things, predicting which which type of snow squall we'll see, and also has some implications on radar utility, which I'll talk about in the next presentation. Um, but these streamer bands are pretty much anything that's training along its own axis is probably going to be more shallow than something that's a more progressive S1 kind of band or some taller popcorn cellular snow squalls. And this uh, this last slide is the um, the one where Carl is now working on a parameter, a snow squall type parameter. So different from the snow squall parameter, which just tells you where snow squalls are favorable, this kind of adds to that and shows maybe which types are more favorable. So uh, basically, he's dividing the depth of that mixed layer by the cloud layer shear. 
um, times relative humidity. So essentially looking at something similar to like the bulk Richardson number using convection, like some warm season convection to kind of tell you which mode you might want to look for. Um, but here values greater than one, that's going to be where you have a lot of instability and less shear. That would be more like the cellular modes. Um, values less than one are going to be more banded modes. There's um, a lot of shear, but less in the way of instability. So more bands in that, in those cases, and you can see how um, the box and whiskers show for each of those cases, like S2, um, that's going to be your single cells. That's the, um, that's, that's where your values are greatest and the smallest values are typically seen for S1s and S4s. So pretty interesting stuff. And, and um, this is all going to be operational soon, as far as the parameter goes on that, that website listed there at the bottom. So just wanted to touch briefly on, on what they're working on at Penn State, since it's very interesting and I think applicable to what we're doing operationally. So that's all we have for this first part of the presentation. Um, I think now might be a good time to break for questions or discussion that there might be so far. All right. Um, thank you all uh, for all the, the great content presented this morning. You know, all the progress that has been made between communication, the understanding of the snow squall parameters, going back to the work of Pete Binakis and everyone else earlier on in the 2010 time frame, really highlights where this research has come and how far it has come over the course of time. Um, you know, one of the things, I guess, if there are no initial questions, um, I also just pinged uh, Josh Weiss in case he wanted to join us. Um, so we'll see if he's available to say a few words, but I'll just throw this out, you know, between the, the communication, like you mentioned your communication with PennDOT and other partners that goes on actively, would you say like there are initial beyond the documentation, beyond the resources that are available to the national program on snow squall approaches and forecasting? Have you found any best practices as far as what sort of information you're sharing directly with partners during these events? And if so, what would that, what does that look like in your experiences, whether it's this year or previous years? Uh, Jordan, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit in uh, some couple of, of snow squall type events we had earlier this winter, uh, late, late fall into early winter. It's interesting to be able to communicate to them ahead of these snow squalls, um, kind of the nexus between the atmospheric and the roadway information. So almost uh, situations where maybe we see a little break in the cloud cover in the satellite image, and you can see the road temp starting to spike up at, uh, ahead of a squall. You know the air temp is cold. You think there's meteorological reason to think that the snow is going to be heavy enough for long enough. And, and it's been a couple times where I had the confidence almost to pinpoint certain parts of a high-speed interstate. Maybe the flash freeze potential here is a little bit more enhanced than it is in other places. And I think they really uh, appreciate us taking a shot at that sometimes. So as far as the type of info we tell them, I think it continues to evolve in the, you know, the, the, the amount of value that we can add with this type of communication. And just to uh, piggyback on what Mike said, I, I think what's become evident to us is that the, the information we share scientifically isn't going to be, and, and wasn't always received um, wholeheartedly until we developed this trust, you know, with, with PennDOT, you know, we were, we were reaching out and saying, Hey, how can we help with these events? And, and there was some hesitance, uh, on their part. We had to win over a few folks higher up in the organization. We, we were primarily having success with, you know, the, the, the truck operators and the folks who were doing mitigation. Um, we really had to be patient and, and kind of ride out a few tough conversations with with folks higher up to convince them that hey we're we're here to help you, we're not here to to undermine any private sector information. But really, it was that relationship building that they then 
they felt comfortable giving us permission to use their Arwis system. Whereas, you know, if we hadn't won those folks over, we may not have gotten that permission. And here we are with, you know, kind of using that data set to some really, you know, fantastic uh, results. Um, so I would say just as important as the scientific is, is the relationship and being patient because there can be some folks with some long held perceptions and, um, you know, just time and trust wins that over. It's about the relationship and building that relationship. So, so when the event happens, you're not working on it. You already have it. When it's sometimes critical, for sure. Um, there is some chat coming in, but I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Kramer. You have the floor. Hey, um, quick question. I, I love the stratification you did of the the different modes of of uh, uh, how the how the the snow squalls uh, appear. Um, one question and a derivative question. Uh, how did you make a distinction between, uh, especially in the cellular form, between a snow squall and a snow shower? Um, and then in those cases, how do you warn on, make decisions to warn for a snow squall in a cellular form where every potential individual's cell could merit a, a warning in that case? I'm, I'm just, I'm struggling to see it a distinction between something organized and some individual cells. Um, and I think that might, some clarification might help me there. Yeah, so those those bins, S1 through S4, that was all done by Carl Schneider at Penn State. That wasn't our work. Um, and we, we weren't really involved with that too much. So we'd have to ask him. Um, but I, I do believe it was based on just a, a reflectivity threshold. And I think that was lower than what we'd usually use for snow squalls. I think you use either 20 or 25 dBZ, uh, not not 30 like we typically do. So, but but that's a good question, yeah. yeah in practice, I'm struggling to see how how to distinguish a snow shower from a sure. snow squall with that definition alone. I, I think in our, in our practice, we would probably, I mean, I know I rely pretty heavily on the snow squall parameter. When that thing is lit up, when it's greater than one, especially when it pushes two, three, four, uh, of course, that depends on which model you're looking at, but I'm I'm referring to the SBC meso-analysis, so that's tuned to the um, the RAT model. Uh, usually, if that's sufficiently high, I would call it a snow squall, and especially if it's confirmed by um, observations of quarter mile visibility, that certainly uh, adds to that confidence as opposed to just just a snow shower. And also piggybacking on Mike here. Um, as far as the impact-based tags go with respect to open cellular events, things just got a lot easier for us with those events. The boxology for, you know, these the open cellular days was horrific. And then, you know, having to make a decision on, on a WIA-based warning for those days was almost, I, I don't want to say impossible, but you were really trying to simplify it by focusing on the interstates where the impact would be. Now, it, you know, not to overwarn or, or, or blanket too many areas, but, you know, where you know you have the snow bursts and say, you're pretty sure most of that area is below freezing, but there's a possibility slightly there could be some, some local flash freezing conditions. You can issue a generic, uh, you know, a general snow squall warning that doesn't activate WIA and then really focus your WIA, the significant tag on the areas where you're highly, more highly confident in a flash freeze. So that's what we're focusing on, the differentiation. Um, you know, not every snow shower is, is going to be a problem. Uh, but as Mike said, focusing on where, where the snow squall parameter lights up and then also, you know, using the tags to your benefit. Um, we should probably, most of our snow squall warnings will be general tags, I, I suspect. And again, it has gotten a lot easier for us now that we have two ways to issue a warning. Now we don't have to, you know, agonize over not issuing a warning in the off hours when we know it's a, a, a really good squall event, uh, whereas that would have woken up so many people before. So I don't know if that helps, Matt, but um, that differentiation is key, and I, I think it just got easier. That's a that's a good a good direction, and like env environmental awareness is important in everything we do. So that's I think that that's that's helpful. Thanks. Sure. Okay, thank you for all that feedback. Uh, a 
lot of good input to move this initiative forward with respect to identification. Uh, I'm going to switch over to a couple of questions first in chat. So the first one was, um, and this was addressed a little bit before, so maybe there's not much more to add to this. How important is having the roadway above freezing before the small? Um, the box and whisker plot that you presented showed a cutoff below freezing, um, but the distributions seem balanced. Does the sharp reduction in visibility have more importance than the flash freeze in most cases? Yeah, I'll, t I'll take a stab at, at that one. Those are really good questions. And I think that it, it gets back a little bit, I think, to the stra our warning strategy that, that, that Greg talked about just now. We're, I, I think that we're most confident in flash freeze conditions when you have both factors at play, where you have uh, a situation where your road was initially above freezing, then plunging, and the low visibility. Um, the visibility is certainly a factor no matter what. If, if a motorist is losing sight, even if the roads are just wet, you could still obviously have an accident, but in that particular case, you know, you're going to have a little bit maybe more stopping power in just a wet roadway versus an icy one. So, uh, you know, maybe it can come down to your true confidence of, of, of a flash freeze, and that can be a differentiating factor for you in maybe what tag you use in, in an SQW. So I think... I think I think they're related. And again, I, the, I'll, that, I'll add to that. Oh, oh sorry, Greg, you go first. Oh, I just want to mention um, you know, the reason that's significant is is stopping distance of vehicles. You know, a fully loaded tractor trailer driving seventy miles an hour in on dry road conditions takes a football length to to fully stop. Once the roadway is frozen over, it's ten times that. So really, you know, people say, "Oh, people are driving too fast for conditions." Well. The condition suddenly changed and they can't slow down <laughs> um, and it, it just has tragic consequences when you have the flash freeze uh, piled into that so and to, to add to that so it looks like the question is about what if the road temperature starts off below freezing even before it, before it's snowing so i i think there's there's ways to get an icy roadway other than the classic flash freeze so the classic flash freeze the roadway starts above above freezing, it starts to snow and then you get a flash freeze. But if the roadway is already sub-freezing, there sure, there sure have been um, a number of pretty gruesome pileups in those cases too. I don't know if those are necessarily um, common or if those are going to be more circumstantial where there's like a lot of traffic to really, um, you know, the pressure of the tires and the vehicles melts some of the snow that's fallen and then it refreezes or um, I also wonder if there's a certain cold threshold where uh, road salt or mitigation might even be uh, not a bad thing to do. Maybe it's counterproductive because maybe it starts to melt some of the snow while it's falling lightly. And then as the snow really comes down in, in a greater intensity, then it starts to freeze again. Um, so maybe that's counterproductive. I wonder maybe that's something that somebody obviously non-weather service, um, more of an expert in, in road mitigation would have to look into that. Um, so certainly uh, that, that's a good question. And I don't think it's necessary for road temperatures to start above freezing in order to get a, a pileup. Yeah, and just along those lines, you know, the worst um, commute in DC history, I think, happened from just like maybe a half inch of snow or less from a clipper event where it, the road surfaces were below freezing in the afternoon. At, I, with Sarah's online, could, could probably talk a long time about that night, but it took people hours to get home just because uh, the, the frictional warming from all the tires, uh, traffic volume plays a huge role in that when, when the existing road surface temperatures are below freezing. So I think you do need the high traffic volume for that. And, you know, an, another thing too, I think that is an issue here is longevity of 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 the heavier snow and this is something that we may may start taking a look at here in our offices you know maybe there's a situation where even if you have the potential for like this classic flash freeze with the road temp plunging below freezing 
perhaps if the snow squall only lasts for three or four minutes, you, you could lower the road temp from 39 to 35. And if it was going to last just a few minutes longer, maybe that would have been enough to, to take it down below freezing. So these are like kind of the real subtleties that, you know, we're, we're actually trying to get into the weeds a little bit and really try to learn a lot more about these events. So there are, there are a lot of things to consider, no doubt. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, a very easy next um, project for us to, to tackle is how long, especially when you start with roads that are much warmer than freezing, how long does it need to snow for to get that, that temperature to come down? And also, how does that relate to subsur subsurface temperatures? So if the subsurface has been you know, below freezing, it's been cold for several days in a row versus it's been warm for the last few days and the sub subsurface is warmer than freezing. Those are all complicating factors that I think deserve to be looked into. Um, and then uh, Raul Pant's second question here, uh, do you know which mode produces the most accidents that are adjusted to the frequency or percentage of the total? I think that's another great question and, and some, uh, some area for us at the office, or the Weather Service office to um, come together with those at Penn State and join our data sets and look into that more closely. That, that's something we want to tackle. We haven't yet, though. So I was just going to throw out another possible research idea tangent here. You know, we we're talking about road temperatures, uh, antecedent road temperatures ahead of the core of an event moving through, regardless of whether it's 60 seconds or 10 minutes long. Now, considering road temperatures aside, part of this also comes down to the rate of progression, how quickly a snow squall is moving. And tied to that question, is it looking at the synoptic to mesoscale setups and associate that with progressive speed of the snow squall? Now, obviously, if you have like an Arctic front, there are typically, even going back to my days at Oswego, you have an Arctic front come down to the northeast. They're usually fairly progressive. They're not really coming through slowly. But on those day where you, days where you have a less forced event, like the one you spoke about, Mike, earlier in this, in this hour, you have different setups that may relate to different rate of progression that can also be added to the RWIS data you presented, which could aid in roadway, basically anti, anti, better anticipating roadway conditions ahead of this, which it sets up the whole framework for the flash freeze and everything that follows, unfortunately. A big wild card is not knowing exactly how roads may be pretreated. You know, and, and a lot of that depends on what our confidence is. Um, I can tell you the day of the, the Schuylkill County, the, the weekly forced uh, one, where some of the cams were showing a, a greater uh, inland extent of some of that banding, which was kind of a signal. We've seen that, um, you know, the, depending upon which cam you look at on the days where there's uh, farther southeast fetch, not fetch, but reach. Um, say down into Southeast PA, we know those areas are more susceptible uh, because they'll have some some warming through the, the clouds before a snow squall gets there. But, um, you know, that's that's going to be a challenge because we're not going to have the information to know exactly when the last pretreatment was. Certainly after a warm spell, after a rainstorm, we know that most roads are, are clean. But, you know, there's complexity and not not knowing exactly what they've done to pre-treat. We're just giving them information, not telling them what to do. Um, so that's we're always going to have to take a mile high approach and maybe even assume that they haven't pre-treated. Jordan, I think another component to that is the storm. If you look at like storm motion vectors for snow squalls, so let's like look at the mean wind and a certain depth. That's going to be very useful for any of those cells or lines that that kind of move that are, that are progressive, but not as useful for the streamer types. So part of that question, I think, is is figuring out what type do we have today? Do we have streamers that are moving along their own axis where you're going to have training, or are they more progressive cells and bands? So that's that's another thing. And I think that's really where Carl's work in coming up with a snow squall type parameter might really help us out too. I'm really excited about the, the type work um, especially since we, we have seen where we expected maybe one band or multi bands turn into this hodgepodge of open cellular plus that 
depending upon how warm the lakes are, you know, wild cards like that, what time of year it is, we have, you know, late season versus early season. So I'm really excited because really the, it, it's, it's figuring out where the flash freeze potential is and what our, what our convective mode is. And I think that work is really timely right now. And, and uh, just tying back to your first question, Jordan, I think as far as communicating to our partners about these events, Again, one of those main things to think about is what type of snow squall do we have today? And it's so easy with these cellular cases where where you, you end up with this big field of cells, but you might not know that the day before. Maybe the day before the models are all focusing in on this strongly forced board max coming through. And you might think that the timing is going to be 3 p.m. in the afternoon. But what ends up happening is there's this decently unstable air mass ahead of that board, board max. And you end up with cellular snow squalls several hours earlier than that. So giving the partners kind of the earliest possible time of heavy snow bursts in those cases and really thinking meteorologically about the setup, I think that's important too. And and the kind of things that Mike and Greg were just talking about, this really argues again, I'll throw out there strongly for the whole mesoanalyst thing in these snow squalls because these are these can be subtle these signatures can be subtle and you really have to be you really have to know your environment that day and your trends and where things are happening how they're happening and why they're happening so um, it definitely all ties in well th thank you for the feedback on all those questions and i think there's just a lot of food for thought on where we go with this research and that paired with the efforts of those at Penn State and all the great work that you've mentioned there as well. Um, since, uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if Josh Wise was able to join us, but irrespective of that, are there any other questions from folks in the field about just where we're going? Um, I don't, I'm not sure if anyone from na national headquarters is still on to answer any further questions to that avail. But if there are any other questions about applications or future work, um, feel free to hit note, note them down. Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to announce that we will be starting up the um, our remote meso analyst project for snow squalls uh, um, jointly with Central Region. Uh, this is an extension of their uh, severe uh, their their uh, severe thunderstorm uh, mesoanalysis project, uh, but we're really looking to uh, kind of leverage our our collective uh, expertise and and group learning, uh, you know, to all uh, you know learn from each other on how to uh, better work with these uh, these these efforts. Uh, so we're going to be starting that up on Monday. Uh, it's coming Monday, December 19th. Uh, there'll be an email going out uh, to all the management uh, the staffs announcing that. Uh, it will be basically you know, done uh, through a facilitated Google chat room. Offices will be able to ask for um, remote mesoanalysis support uh, through, their, uh, through either the Eastern Region or Central Region rocks. Uh, you know, and and um, the establishment of that will be posted, uh, you know, in, in in the rock chat rooms. So we're really excited about uh, this new foray into uh, mesoanalysis uh, with a winter weather application. Awesome, thank you, Jeff, and thank the timely mention as we're having this conversation. So perfect fit for that. Um, I'll also just throw a separate plug in. Um, been a couple of emails over time, and it did. You know, I know in the in the Huija battle, you know, looking at satellite, looking at surface obs, dealing with partners and everything in between, a lot going on. But I'll just throw out um, if anyone also happens to be looking at satellite data for the JPSS program, including new caps to supplement that data, being whether it goes through um, then the way to profiles, for example, or the day cloud phase distinction, which is great for identifying and distinguishing these snow squalls as they're developing and evolving in their, in their, during their track across the region. If anyone is looking at new caps plan view or new caps um, profile data, uh, feel free 
to just shoot me directly a message on, you know, how you used it or how you applied it, because this also helps to advance further algorithm development they're currently working on. So trying to coordinate that with them. So just a plug for moving forward. Um, and of course, I understand things get busy, but if I, in the back of our minds, we're moving forward. That'd be good. Um, yes. I was going to say, Jordan, I'll piggyback off what you just said. I think two potentially really useful data sets in uh, going into snow squall scenarios could be a well-timed in place, new caps sounding, and I and the new ACARS site too. Um, it could really yes. help with the thermodynamic profile assessments. And, and to that end, I guess I'll throw in another plug related to this. Um, the new caps program just released, and this is on... Um, our Eastern Region SSD satellite section as well at the top of the quick guide section, a brand new um, algorithm basics descriptive document that breaks down how the new caps algorithm is designed. This is hot off the press in the last week or two. It was approved through the program. So that's on our Google site. Um, the long and the short of it is that, as we know, as cloud cover ex increases, the efficacy and the reliability of the new caps profiles does go down. And that caps off at around 80%. That's the short version of it. Um, but more details there. Um, if there are questions about that, we also have on page 15 out of 16 on the same Google site satellite section, a section on new caps data. And I have an additional new caps training resource link there that's from the new caps climb cap program. If there are questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. And we can coordinate that with the program developers as well. So just wanted to give you a heads up. And again, it's one of many more data sets that are available, but are useful to do spot on the spot diagnosis of the nature of the profile ahead of these events, which as we're seeing is critical along with other factors. So that's all I'll, I'll add for now. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Jordan, I've got some, I've got about like 10 minutes worth of slides for a little bit more in depth about the radar detection. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we budgeted the time, so feel free to take it away again. Let's go back into sure. discussion. Sure. All right. I'll get my screen set up and shared. All right. So, this is some work that we've done here at the office and, and State College over the past about a year now, uh, with some significant help from one of our student volunteers, Alvin Chung, who was at Penn State at the time, and now he's at University of Maryland. Um, but a lot of this work could not have been done without him. So um, basically what we were looking at, it's pretty well known that as snow squalls move away from the radar, the radar measures lower reflectivity. And this is because they're shallow in nature, and as you go away from the radar, the radar beam height is progressively higher above the ground. So we wanted to know, since we have this uh, national guidance of using 30 dBZs as a, as a warning threshold, obviously we know that doesn't work everywhere, but we wanted to quantify at what distance does it no longer work for us. Uh, we also wanted to create a map uh, showing the optimal radar to use at any given location in Pennsylvania, and also think about what other tools can we use to supplement radar imagery. So we started out with a, a data set of significant crashes from PennDOT from 2008 to 2016. And we filtered that through by identifying snow squall days. We went, uh, had another student volunteer go day by day and, and find days where there were snow squall events. And then we filtered the pileup database by that and then further filtered the pileup database by looking at all the pileups and whether or not they occurred uh, within some heavy heavy precipitation on radar and where that, um, you know, where the actual radar looked like snow squalls as opposed to something more stratiform or more synoptic based system. We ended up with 43 pileups that met all those, all that criteria. And the pileups all had four, four cars, four vehicles or more in each one. Uh, we looked specifically within 200 kilometers of the state college radar. And we found the maximum state college reflectivity uh, within a 15 kilometer radius, plus or minus 15 minutes from the crash time of each incident. We wanted to give a buffer there because the crash times of each incident weren't always correct. That's based on the police report and that's just an estimate based on 
uh, when the calls came in. So oftentimes they were a little bit earlier, I think, um, than what was actually logged or that there could have been some other sources that were there. So we wanted to give a, a pretty generous buffer. And this is a plot of all the maximum reflectivities for all the different pileup points. So you can see as you're closer to the state college radar, a lot of these points had reflectivity greater than 35 dBZ. Those are the points in red. As you go farther away, as you head into Schuylkill County, which is still our CWA, um, there's, there were several pileups that had reflectivity less than 15 dBZ as far as the maximum goes. And that max is not, not like a time average or, or, or anything. It's just the, literally the radar gate with the maximum reflectivity. Um, so when you get to those distances, there's some less than 15 dBZ, but there's also some that are higher. Um, for example, this pile up here had a reflectivity above 30 dBZ, this one above 25, this one above 15. So there's still a, a range as, as far as uh, the snowfall goes, snowfalls go. And that probably ties back into Carl Schneider's work about the different classifications and based on what type, what cell mode you have or linear mode, um, you might have different depths of the mixed layer that correspond with each of those modes. So bottom line here is we do see that when you're closer to the radar, that 30 dBZ reflectivity works. And once you move farther away, it doesn't work quite as well. So we took all those points and we made a scatter plot. Um, the scatter plot that I'm showing here on the x-axis is the beam center height um, above sea level. But we also have plots that are not shown here that show it above the ground level, um, show it as a function of distance from the radar, so radar range. They all pretty much show the same story, which is as, as you go farther away, the beam height is higher and you end up with a lower maximum reflectivity. And again, that 30 dBZ threshold works almost 100% of the time in, in this data set when the beam height is less than about 8,000 feet or uh, 2,500 meters, somewhere around that, that range is where it pretty much always works. Um, but based on this data, we drew a best fit line as well as a plus and minus one standard deviation, uh, which are shown in the red and blue um, uh, lines that are kind of perturbed from the best fit. And from those, we were able to calculate what the probability of detection is uh, using just the 30 dBZ radar reflectivity threshold at different heights and at different radar ranges. So this next plot here is just showing the minimum radar height above ground level. This is for the center line of the radar um, up all across Pennsylvania. So this is not just based on the state college radar, but takes into account all the radars available and you can see that we have pretty good radar coverage near State College, but as you head down to Harrisburg, and especially this quarter from Harris Harrisburg through Lebanon and up to Hazleton, um, we have this area where the minimum radar height of ground level is in excess of 2,500 meters, um, which is approximately 8,000 feet. So that's really our area uh, where locally we know that that's going to be the hardest spot to detect a snow squall, especially if it's if it's happening to develop there or intensify there, sure, if we can uh, track something more steady state from State College and it and it moves into that area, we can just simply, you know, the radar reflectivities might drop off, but it looks the same on satellite. We can assume that it's steady state and still, still warnable. Um, but this is our challenging spot. So what we ended up doing was using, using that um, best fit model and the plus minus one standard deviation we came up with these maps of POD, probability of detection, uh, using the relationship with the radar beam height above sea level and also the radar height um, above ground level and also the, uh, the distance from the radar. And each one of them shows pretty much the same story, but slightly different numbers. So what we ended up doing at the end was merging those three models, the above ground level, above sea level, and distance from the radar merging them together to take an average, like an equally weighted average, and I'll show that in the next slide. Um, but bottom line here is um, there are some differences whether you use the uh, beam height versus uh, the distance. And the reason why we want to consider both is because as you move away from the radar, you also have beam widening. So you have that lower, coarser resolution problem of detecting snow squalls when they're farther away. So uh, that that's why if you look at just the distance from the radar, there is this greater area of a POD less than 35% uh, 
um, in that area. And of course, I just want to make it clear here that the POD model here is not an estimate of how well snowfall warnings would perform uh, because it's strictly based on that 30 dBZ threshold and not uh, based on the other tools that we have in our toolbox to issue warnings. Another thing that we did here is make maps of um, the radar with the shortest distance to a sample, which I have seen other, other um, people do, and these kind of maps are available online. Uh, but something that I hadn't seen yet and something maybe that's unique, I'm not sure, is making maps of the radar with the sample closest to the ground. So this takes into account not just the distance, but also the elevation of the um, ray domes themselves and also, if the radar happens to have a lower tilt than 0 0.5 degrees, like um, Buffalo uses 0 0.3 degrees and, and Cleveland uses 0 0.4 degrees, so it takes into account that as well. So you can see that even though, uh, let's take this, this part of Pennsylvania, for example, even though the state college radar is closer, um, the Buffalo radar actually sees it a little bit better because it has that lower tilt. And similar story in southern Pennsylvania, uh, let's take... Um, northern Fulton County, for example, even though the state college radar is closer, and even though the Sterling radar has the same tilt, 0 0.5 degrees, the Sterling radar is just simply at a lower elevation to start with. So it actually sees uh, lower to the ground um, in, in central and northern Fulton County. Even. So we made these maps, and I think that these are really useful for, for operations. We haven't yet imported them into AWIPS, but the goal here is to have them as a base map in AWIPS so that the forecaster could ideally have the sample tool on and roll their mouse over different portions of, of the CWA and have, have the sample tell you which radar is either closest with the best resolution or lowest down to the ground, uh, which has obviously applications in snow squall forecasting and, and, and warning detection, um, but also downbursts and tornadoes and anything severe weather-wise, this could also be a pretty helpful tool. Um, this next map here is just overlaying that lowest available radar beam map that I had just showed on top of the merged POD model, which again is an equal weight average of the POD models using radar distance, beam height above sea level, and beam height above ground level. And bottom line here is anything in green, we have pretty good uh, pretty good POD if we use that 30 dBG threshold. So that's a, a probably half of Pennsylvania. The other half in yellow, orange, and red, we have less than the 75 dBG POD. And especially this area in orange is where we need to focus on those other tools. Um, orange and red is less than a 50% POD. And less than red is less than 35% POD. So about one in every three stone squalls is detected using that threshold. The other two out of three are missed. Uh, so that's where, really where we need to focus on those other tools. Uh, these, these slide, um, this slide just shows the progression of a snow squall out of its best range using CCX radar and into the best range using um, Philly's radar. And you can really see these are all at the same time uh, for each, each column. Um, you can see State College sees it best at the beginning and then ultimately Philly sees it best. So just, just kind of an example there. So regarding other tools we can use, uh, one of the alternatives is the um, MRMS 18 dBZ echo tops. But of course, the problem with that is you need the radar to see at least 18 dBZ, which is not always the case as you move far away. This is pretty good with the uh, linear S1 kind of cases that we see, the stronger, more strongly forced snow squalls, but does not work nearly as well for streamers or for those multi-cell, multi-line hybrid cases, um, especially where the, they, um, where the streamers move along their own axis. Those tend to be the more shallow cases and they don't work quite as well. Another alternative to using the 18 dBZ threshold could potentially be actually having this um, scatter plot printed out. And for you know each case, as you sample them, look at what your minimum radar um, level is, and look at the reflectivity at the sample point and see where it lies on this um, scatter plot that could potentially have some utility. But of course, you might end up with some false alarms where maybe something happens to be taller and, and has less 
reflectivity is not as strong, it might still show up on this scatter plot within the range. Uh, so there's it's just another tool that maybe potentially we can use, but um, definitely not the only answer. Uh, the last thing that we did was just look at what if we hypothetically lower the lowest tilt of the state college radar beam from 0 0.5 to 0 0.3 degrees. We recalculated what the beam height would be, and you can see that there is some beam height improvement down in this area where we have the lowest POD of snow squalls uh, using radar reflectivity. Um, that improves by as much as about half a kilometer. And this is assuming no beam blockage. So obviously, if we were to consider lowering the tilt, the radar rock would have to send somebody here. They'd have to do a site survey, and they'd have to see if there's actually any beam blockage. We didn't take that into account. Uh, this is assuming none. So if we do end up lowering the beam height in this area by half a kilometer, how does that fit into the, the POD models? Um, basically, it's showing that it would improve POD by... Um, by about 15%, bring it up from 35% to near 50%. So we'd still not see, uh, you know, every every other snow squall statistically, um, but that's better than one in every three. So that's what we've been working on as far as as far as radar detection goes. And certainly happy to take any questions and hear any discussion that anybody has in the next nine minutes that we have. All right, Mike, thank you so much for sharing that presentation. Um, so I guess I, I'll start off with a couple of questions myself. So, you know, you mentioned having alternative data set options as being, you know, the, the point in question of how do we move forward? What data sets are best applied in these situations? One, one idea I'll throw out, and this is very circumstantial, I understand that, is looking at like JPSS, um, either snowfall rate or MSFR data that when there are passes, that can also be a helpful supplement. I don't know if that's something that's been considered before, uh, but that is one option. Uh, in addition to that, you know, you show the different plots and the ratios of detection. I'm just curious. So you showed it for the state college radar or those graphics. So for the for the situ for those radars, so for example, Buffalo and Cleveland, that have the lower tilts, does that automatically the st statistics would presumptively be better for them for those lower tilts from the get go? Is that uh, is that that's correct? So I I kind of blew through some of the assumptions that I made just in this for the sake of time, but the assumption here was that the POD model that was developed using the state college radar would roughly be the same for all other radars. Um, and since since two, the merged POD model takes into account distance from the radar, um, beam height above ground level and beam height above sea level. So since two of those factors are beam height, um, that should make it so that like for the Buffalo radar, we'd see similar results since it, it's not relative to distance. Those two are re relative to um, beam height. But, but we make that assumption that we'd have similar results, and then that assumption is applied to all the other radars. So those maps for Pennsylvania, um, they take into account all the radars, but assuming the same POD model for, for each one based on state college, if that makes sense. I'm sorry if it's a little bit difficult for me to explain right now. No, no, that definitely helps. Um, I think also um, you mentioned to go just kind of picking off that question, the graphics that were generated showing from the ground or at different levels, the um, plausibility of detection that were available online. Are those in a specific like repository or ArcGIS, ArcGIS um, folder or directory if people are interested in gaining access to those maps moving forward? They aren't yet, but no, that, that's the plan is, again, to start in our office and make some base maps for AWIPS. And then um, as long as that's all successful, we could we could certainly share those out. Yeah, because that would be extraordinarily insightful for all offices in these situations, regionally and beyond. Even Century, you know, deals with snow squalls too for that matter, of course. Hence what Jeff mentioned earlier about this initiative that's starting up early next week. So this would be very helpful to have access to understand where the radar is falling short, where it's succeeding, and to have that awareness in operations and especially ahead of the situation. So it's in 
on the mind. So that sounds good. Um, I guess I'll throw it out again. If there are any other questions from folks in the field about this fourth discussion presented today. Okay, quieter crowd now. I guess once you pass an hour, things settle out. Um, so above all else, um, you know, Greg, Mike, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time today to present what really is important work to be shared. Um, and I'm glad we have had that opportunity to do so. You know, as far as where this is going moving forward, um, you mentioned all the communication with partners, which is excellent, that's happening and all the progress that's been made. I think that's also something we have to also remind ourselves is the progress we're making as opposed to what we're not doing, but what we've done and how far we've come with the research that has been done. So really you know, credit to you, all of your folks at, at the State College Office. So thank you to all the work that you've done and all the work that precedes you going back to the earlier 2010s research I mentioned earlier with Pete Panakis and everyone else that's been involved. And of course, to the national program between Mike Musilli, Sarah Prefater, and all the improvements in the WIA tags and the improved watch approaches being taken now. So with that as a reminder, again, to everyone, this webinar was recorded. So we will have it uploaded to our Eastern Region Google site science sharing webinar section uh, by later today. And with that, um, we do have, uh, just as housekeeping, likely some webinars coming into early next year, but we'll get those announced as we have them firmed up. But other than that, I wish everyone a happy and a healthy holiday season. Thank you so much.